And those of you who are fairly active on YouTube in terms of watching Hi-Fi related content will probably have come across Pearl Acoustics and Harley Lovegrove. He has a great channel and I particularly enjoyed his series discussing 10 iconic turntables and why he finally selected the Rega P10 for his listening room. The Sibelius is the culmination of his lifelong passion to produce a pure, simple speaker tuned like a musical instrument with no electronic crossover components. I've had quite a few requests over the years to review the Sibelius speaker, so when I recently bumped into Harley at the Northwest Audio Show, if he hadn't suggested that I review his speaker, I'd have been asking him. Harley was gracious enough to offer me and a couple of my accompanying Patreons to a private audition at the start of the second day. The Sibelius speakers sounded pretty good in that demo, driven by Thomas and Dodge's Galleon TS120 amplifier. That doesn't tell me much though. The threshold for things sounding decent at a show is fairly low, and after you've had a day or so of generally underwhelming demos, it's easy to be impressed with something that you eventually stumble upon that sounds fairly decent. Harley isn't going to get any special treatment here, nor would he expect to. I'll be telling you the strengths and the weaknesses of the Sibelius. And as always, these opinions are unfiltered and purely my own. So how did I get on with the Sibelius CG speakers? The Pearl Acoustic Sibelius speakers have traditionally been available in a series of stained matte varnish finishes and wax oil finishes applied to a solid 32 mm thick French oak cabinet, slow grown and obtained from a sustainable source. The retail price is €4,950 excluding taxes and shipping or £5,100 which includes VAT but excludes shipping to the UK. Coloured matte and gloss options are new. They cost quite a bit more due to the extra labour involved in priming and painting the cabinet to automotive grade finished standards. Quite rightly, the Pearl team couldn't bring themselves to paint fine oak, so instead elected for a 30mm Baltic birch plywood. The price is an extra grand at €5,950 and £6,100, respectively. These are tall, slim speakers measuring over a metre at 1,093mm high, 225mm wide and 295mm deep. That's 43.0 x 8.9 by 11.6 inches, each speaker weighs 23 kilograms or 51 pounds. The driver is based around a 100 mm 4 inch full range metal alloy cone, available in a silver finish they term the SG model or a copper finish called the CG model that I have here. The base loading is unconventional, but it's closer in concept to a transmission line speaker rather than a ported design, something that I'll discuss in greater depth shortly. The rear has just one set of reasonable quality speaker binding posts by wiring a full range driver would be pointless. They're fairly high up to keep internal wiring lengths to a minimum, so you may have to compensate with longer speaker cable runs externally. My review samples came with the optional Sibelius stands, essentially bases with outrigger feet. Sound quality benefits aside, they considerably improve protection from impact and reduce the likelihood of the speakers toppling over. That alone may justify shelling out the extra 395 euros or 405 pounds. Harley's design philosophy is simple. To produce a speaker that uses a single drive unit capable of handling almost the entire frequency spectrum, free from any electrical components, so the amplifier couples directly to the back of the drive unit. No passive resistors, but in particular the capacitors and inductors that you find in filters and crossovers. Even speakers with low order crossovers of minimal parts aren't totally phase coherent. The subtle shifts in timing, especially around the crossover region, result in many multi-driver speakers sounding artificial. Single driver speakers have their problems too. Large cones are great for shifting air to reproduce low frequencies, but their large moving mass means that they can't move fast enough to recreate high frequencies. Small cones or diaphragms are light enough to reach the upper limits of our audible spectrum and beyond, but they don't have the surface area to shift enough air in the lower registers. A 10 centimeter cone like the one found in the Sibelius is theoretically ideal for the mid-range, but not for the extreme highs and lows. So how did Pearl Acoustics get around this problem? 
Mark Fenland's Alpair 10 metal alloy driver has a particular cone geometry. You see that phase plug in the middle that looks curiously like a tweeter. It helps to extend the frequency response out to 25,000 Hertz. Okay, so that's the top end, but what about the low frequencies? How did they manage to get a 10 centimeter driver to extend to 38 Hertz? That's the reported minus six dB point anechoically. So practically speaking, the Sibelius speaker should be able to dig down even a bit further with some room boundary gain. Here, Harley was inspired by one of the pioneers of loudspeaker design. Paul Voigt developed the first ever electric recording system in 1926, and then went on to work for Lowther, where he produced many groundbreaking products. Ooh, Lowther, what a blast from the past that is. The Sibelius speakers are based around the principles of a Voigt tapered quarter wave tube. You want me to say that again? A Voigt tapered quarter wave tube, thankfully sometimes also referred to as a Voigt pipe. It shares many similarities with the base loading of a transmission line speaker, but also has some key differences. Both designs take advantage of a quarter wave resonance by absorbing the back wave of the driver, but where a transmission line generally narrows towards a vented output, the Voigt pipe actually widens. It could be thought of as a transmission line in reverse, but also, because of that geometry, embodies some horn characteristics. Think of it a bit like blowing air across a bottle. A small amount of air, in this case generated from the back wave of the driver, is used to excite a much larger column of air inside a chamber to reproduce low frequencies. It's different to a ported design that operates over a very narrow bandwidth of frequencies. A Voigt pipe, like a transmission speaker, has a much wider bandwidth. And if designed correctly, the output of the pipe should be in phase with the driver. Like a transmission line, both designs are prized for their deep, tight, textured base. Harley spent years going through an iterative process, tuning the cabinet until the pipe's output integrated seamlessly with the driver, even getting Mark Fenlon to amend the geometry of his driver's voice coil to suit the impedance of the cabinet. That's why this speaker probably has to be built on site at the facility in Belgium. It's very difficult to maintain consistency and quality control with such a complex cabinet built off site. The Sibelius speakers do things in the bass and lower mid range that are simply glorious. It's the kind of articulation that I've only experienced from transmission line speakers before. Play a double bass, a drum solo, or even an Indian tabla, which is the fastest percussive instrument there is. And there's so much clarity, sense of correct mass and sheer definition, that I can't help but think, why aren't all speakers bass loaded as either transmission lines or Voigt pipes? Well, I know why they aren't, complexity of build, but let's not get into that. The Sibelius aren't gonna give you the macro dynamic swings that you get from even compact floor standards like the Graham Audio LS6Fs, the 3,333 pound ported speakers have a more impressive mid bass thud, but not quite the definition of the Sibelius in the lower octaves. There's something special about the mid range too. There's just enough prominence or more specifically an uplift in the presence region, that's between two and four K, to make vocals and lead instruments stand out. It's what gives the Pearl Acoustics a sense of being there with live recordings. It's a trait that's shared with well-designed horn speakers, such as the Fine Audio Vintage Classic 8s, that retail for £4,499, a liveliness without ever venturing into brightness or aggression. However, the Sibelius are significantly more resolving in the mid-band. The Pearl speakers have a mid-range with excellent transient attack, good body, and a nice decay. Micro details pop out, just adding an extra sense of realism. They won't match the ATC SEM 40s with their famous three inch mid-range driver when it comes to acoustic mass. Performers in the 4,200 pound entry ATC floor standards are better fleshed out, but the Sibelius give up nothing in terms of clarity or instrument separation. The high frequencies are where the limitations of a single driver become more apparent. Setting up the speakers correctly is key, which I'll talk about in more detail in the next section. If you get it right, the Sibelius are neither dark nor bright, and the treble sits more in balance with the rest of the frequency spectrum. They don't have the transparency to reveal upper harmonics and a sense of airiness like the best compact stand mount speakers. The 1,995 pound Neat Petite Classics have them beaten for speed and openness on top, 
with their AMT tweeter. So do the Dali Epicon 2s that retail for a similar price at £5,199. The Dalis have a remarkably expressive soft dome tweeter and just as much articulation in the mid-range, even though they don't have the energy of the Sibelius. I haven't reviewed any stand mounts that can compete with these pearl acoustic speakers when it comes to definition and depth in the bass. But as far as soundstage and imaging is concerned, it's a case of job done. As long as it's there in the recording, instruments will spread well beyond the boundaries of the speakers with good soundstage depth and performers secure in their location. It isn't quite the touch them on the shoulder kind of presentation that you get from the neat petite classics or my Pratt Response 1 SCs but it's as good as any compact floor standard that I've heard up to now. It took time, care, and a little bit of know-how to get the Sibelius speakers to work optimally in my room. The very nice user guide that comes with them says that they'll work well close to walls, which is something I can't confirm or deny. My room really isn't set up for that kind of scenario. What I can say is that altering the distance they were from walls influenced bass clarity by quite a bit. I wound up with them no further into the room than many stand mounts, so you're unlikely to overload even medium-sized rooms with bass energy, but my recommendation would be to maintain a minimum distance of 90 centimeters or three feet from wall to front baffle to ameliorate time smearing effects. The Spalius are pretty sensitive to tow in as well, and this is to be expected to some extent with full range drivers that are gonna narrow their dispersion as you go higher up the frequency range. And here, yet again, my mileage varied to what is Pearl Acoustic's standard recommendation, which is to have the speakers firing out directly into the room. I find having them slightly wider apart with a significant amount of toe-in, but still wider my shoulders, worked in my room much better. Certainly, the amount of toe-in influences the treble energy received in the sweet spot more than wider dispersion speakers, but get it right and that sweet spot will be wider than most multi-driver speakers. These speakers are great for casual listening as you walk around the room. As long as they're set up correctly, they're capable of very evenly loading the room with bass and mid-range frequencies. So what about the stands? Should you go for those? Well, if you're concerned about people accidentally kicking and potentially toppling over your Sibelius speakers, then the stands are pretty much a no-brainer. I also detected a considerable improvement to the bass definition with the speakers sat on the stands as opposed to the floor. This is likely because raising the speakers allows the low frequencies exiting the horn to disperse better. However, these speakers are already pretty tall and raising them on the stands increases the height by 45 millimeters, that's almost two inches. And because the Sibelius are pretty directional in the top two octaves, you don't want the driver sitting too much above ear height. So that might be a consideration. Also, you don't want to be too close to the speakers. This is not a ported design, but a horn loaded pipe that produces quite a bit of mid frequencies along with the bass. You need to allow it to integrate with the main driver. I'd maintain an equilateral triangle with the speakers at least two meters apart and listening at a similar distance. That's about seven feet. The Sibelius are ultra revealing in the bass and the mid range, but not in a way that makes them overly analytical. Far from it, you can play poor recordings. It's just that you're gonna appreciate the really good ones. And their resolving abilities have led me to give them a pet name, the truth. The pugilistic sports aren't so fashionable these days, but they are a passion of mine. Occasionally a competitor comes along that represents the standard in a division and tells you exactly the strengths and weaknesses of what you put in front of them. As far as the base and mids are concerned, I haven't reviewed anything so far that lays bare the characteristics of upstream amplifiers the way the Sibelius do. So I tried a bunch of amplifiers, let's whiz through them. The only amplifier that Harley and me share in our arsenal is the SMSL VMV A1. I appreciated the rich tonality of that amplifier, but it didn't have the resolution or bass control to do the Sibelius justice. The exposure 2510 was a better starting point. The 1,750 pound exposure amplifier demonstrated the tonality, clarity, refinement, and driving ability to feel that all bases were covered. In the absence of the Galleon TS20 I heard at the show, I called upon the Wilsington R8 with upgraded PS vein tubes. I wasn't disappointed. The R8 is a very bold, rich sounding amplifier and was thoroughly enjoyable with these speakers. The Galleon is a more powerful amplifier than the Wilsington R8 
and more expensive, I'd expect it to have almost certainly better bass control, but the R8 acquitted itself admirably for what is essentially around a 1500 pound tube amplifier with the upgraded tubes. The soundstage opened up when I switched to the Hegel H190, as did instrument separation, but the H190 can sound a little dry, especially in the bass. Rarely has this characteristic been so prominent as with these speakers. I couldn't help but feel that the Hegel was over damping the driver, and that was being even more emphasized by the Voigt pipe bass loading. It's a bit like having the suspension in your car too stiff. You feel every bump in the road, and if only things were a little bit looser, you'd have a more pleasant journey. And in this case, a little bit more freedom of expression. I was reminded why I love my Exposure 21 Pre and 18 Super Monoblock so much, despite them being 25 years old. They threw out the widest and deepest soundstage with precise imaging, and just enough richness added to the tonality for my liking. Like many vintage amps, there was some softness in the bass, and that's despite them being recapped and having their power supply filter capacitance upgraded from 20,000 microfarads per channel to 80,000 microfarads per channel. Don't try that at home unless you know what you're doing. Anyway, besides, they were great, but they weren't my favorite pairing with the Sibelius speakers. The MVAs are back because I'm reviewing their big monoblocks, but the little P50SA and S80 prove that you don't need big power amps to drive the Pearl Acoustic speakers. The upgraded version of this preamp sells for 830 pounds, and it's matching 35 watt per channel power amp, 885 pounds. They're all you need to hear what the Sibelius can do. They don't have quite the scale and dynamics of my vintage exposures, but they're cleaner, have better timing and a more neutral tone, as long as you keep things to moderate volumes. And the Sibelius play awesome at low volumes. That's what the benefit of having no crossover can do. But I wouldn't play much above an average listening level of around 85 decibels. Otherwise, you're asking an awful lot of a single 10 centimeter driver. Officially, they're rated at 87 decibels into a 7.2 ohm impedance, and that's why you don't need a powerhouse. You just need good quality amplification. The Pearl Acoustic Sibelius are the realization of Harley's ambition to produce single driver speakers capable of covering almost the entire frequency spectrum with the benefits of having no crossover or filters Handcrafted from sustainable, slow-grown 32mm French oak or 24-layer high-density Baltic birch plywood with a painted finish, the cabinets are tuned as much like musical instruments as they are speakers. The caveats are pretty obvious, and I can sense the typing terriers, so let's deal with price first. £5,100 is quite a bit to pay for a pair of single-driver speakers, no matter how fancy the cabinet. An extra thousand pounds for a painted finish? Raise my eyebrows. I did query this with Pearl Acoustics and they confirmed that although the European oak is more expensive, finishing the Baltic birch ply is a lot more labor intensive. There's as much as 18 to 20 layers each hand polished and rubbed down between coats to get the desired finish. I still think that the Pearl team need to look at refining the process and try and get that disparity down. It's not an issue for me. I prefer the wood finish anyway. As for other caveats, there's other speakers of this price that are gonna play louder, have deeper bass, and even tweeters that reveal more on the top end. And that's fair enough, but that's not what's intended here. Some 90 years after Paul Voigt invented the tapered quarter wave tube, the Voigt pipe, I'm really grateful that the Pearl Acoustics team continue his legacy in some form to this day. Judging by the clarity, definition and tonality generated by these speakers in the bass and the mid-range, it appears that we've forgotten as much as we have learned about speaker design in the intervening period. They're no slouch in the upper octaves either. The Pearl Acoustic Sibelius CG speakers get highly recommended from this channel. My question of the day is simple. What interesting products have you come across along your hi-fi journey? Please share that in the comment section. All that remains for me to say is if you like what I'm doing with this channel, you want to see it grow and you haven't done so already, please like, share, subscribe, hit the bell notification. Check me out on Patreon. There's a couple of consultancy services there that you can access if you think I can help you on your audiophile journey. Also check out the ABA Club on Patreon, which is a great way to interact with me and other Patreons. But for today, for now, a British audiophile, signing off.